episode 297 of the Tennis Files podcast, you'll learn about optimal performance, how to use data, and the biggest fitness misconceptions with this Tennis Summit 2023 preview episode. Hey there, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. It's really nice to be back on the show. I actually spent a really fun weekend at TennisCon Live in Tampa with Gigi Fernandez, my great pal Peter Freeman, and a bunch of other coaches. Um, big shout outs to Jorge Capistani, John Craig, Kevin Garlington, Jeff Greenwald, and Ryan Reedy, and the 20 participants as well. Uh, I have to say, they were all uh, incredible, really nice people, like super passionate about the game. And I really can't commend them enough for just the the great way they approached all the lessons and and tried their best with what we were teaching them it was just like an amazing time and i can't wait for it to to come back next year um but speaking of um i guess groups of coaches and tennis pros i'm also uh working on tennis summit 2023 and in fact it's actually open for registration right now i uh, opened up a couple of days ago as of the this recording. So you can go to tennisfilesummit.com and I'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, uh, because we are having this uh, seventh year of the conference, I thought I'd put together a few preview episodes of the summit. So I took three uh, really good uh, presentations that we have already recorded. Um, as you know, uh, well, if you've been to any of my summits before, you know that um, some of the episodes we record beforehand just because of scheduling, um, so it's ready to go, and other sessions we do live. So um, I have for you today previews of Jeff Salzenstein's session on how to achieve optimal performance and decrease stress, and then a preview of Mark Sophilis's presentation on how to use data to win more matches. And uh, Dr. Mark Kovacs's presentation on the most important misconceptions around tennis fitness. So these are really um, fantastic ones, great coaches. Um, as you know, um, Jeff, he, he heads Tennis Evolution and he broke the top 100 in the world for the first time at the age of 30, which is incredible. Uh, Mark is the head coach at Melbourne International Tennis School in Australia and has coached a bunch of pros as well. Um, and then Dr. Mark Kovacs is probably the uh, most <laughs> famous um, performance physiologist and uh, researcher in the game of tennis. And he has trained many top professional tennis players as well, including John Isner, Sloan Stevens, Sam Querrey, etc. And he founded the Kovacs Institute and the International Tennis Performance Association with uh, his wife, Mary Jo Kovacs. So, yes, uh, big up, as they say in England, to uh, all of these coaches. I think that they have put forth some great stuff. And so I'll give you a little preview of each of them, about 12 to 15 minutes uh, for each uh, preview here. So chock full of great stuff. And then if you want to watch the full uh, sessions, uh, presentations of these coaches and about like 40 others in total, then go to tennisfilesummit.com. So with that, uh, here are the preview episodes for this show. I'm really looking forward to sharing stories and perspectives and even strategies to help the listeners uh, perform at higher levels and be able to decrease stress on and off the tennis court. Yeah, it's going to be very uh, exciting for me. Um, you know, I've just learned so much from you over the years, you know, where it was, uh, you know, technical analysis beforehand or mental game strategies. And today we also have something kind of, I guess, more on the mental side. So I guess, um, you know, there's going to be a fair bit of a uh, fair amount of people who maybe don't know, you know, your full tennis story. So I was wondering if maybe you could cover some of that. I'd love to. I will take you through. Uh, I will take you through the story arc, and then, of course, you can fill in the gaps if any if I left out anything or if you want to drill into that. So uh, background real quick uh, is 
Well, actually, let me, I'll do, I'll, you know what I'll do is I'll start with a story. So the story I like to start with is my 1997 US Open second round match against Michael Chang. Uh, it's a night match. There's 24,000 people inside Arthur Ashe Stadium. It's the first year of the Arthur Ashe Stadium that they started playing matches there. So uh, time flies when you're having fun. And uh, John McEnroe on the call, millions of people watching on TV. <clears throat> and I started playing incredible tennis in the first set against Michael Chang after some early nerves. And I broke Chang's serve and got up 5-4 in the first set. I was serving at set point, and I was known for my serve, so definitely an advantage to be serving at set point against Michael Chang. And I hit my best serve, which is a wide slice, and I came into the net serving volley. I hit a backhand volley to the open court just out of Chang's reach, and I won the first set. And when I won the first set, you know, there's the little fist pump. And then I, I looked around, I could see so many people just standing up and like pointing at me, like, where did this guy come from? Like, who is this guy? We don't even know who he is. He's ranked 140 in the world and he's taken down Cheng. And I remember just kind of walking back to the baseline and I have this little smirk on my face and the TV cameras catch it. And that's when I tell people that's when the match ended which is crazy to think because we'd only played one set and it's a three out of five set match. But the reason that the match ended was because internally the thoughts and the limiting beliefs that I had inside me were, thank God you didn't embarrass yourself tonight. And my thoughts created my reality. My set point, my baseline was just don't embarrass yourself in front of the world tonight. Don't lose 6-1-6-1-6-1. You know, make it an interesting, entertaining match. And so I succeeded. I achieved my goal. I got to the level of my thoughts. And so um, I ended up losing that match in four sets and signed with an agent the next day. So a lot of players or people thought that I was on my way to the top 50 in the world. And I like to start with that story because what I think it shares, it, what it what it exposes is that, um, yes, I was doing extraordinary things on a tennis court and I achieved an elite level as a tennis player. But I also am very ordinary, like millions and billions of other people out there with our limiting thoughts, with our limiting beliefs. And those are that's one way that we can hold ourselves back on and off the tennis court. And so with that story, um, if you have a question, Amir Bon, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet for a moment. Otherwise, I'll continue and kind of go backtrack to give people a little more context behind my background leading up to that Chang match and beyond. Yeah, thanks for pausing, Jeff. Um, yeah, I just can't help myself asking questions here. But I, I guess, and you probably will cover this a bit later as well, but um, I mean, how would you have ideally reacted? Would it be something like, you know, you win the first set and you say something like, um, still a long way to go, or like, I mean, how would you have maybe self-talked your, your way differently? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, leading up to that match that day at the U S open, I remember, I think I warm up three or four times that day for the night match. So oh, wow. to warm up that many times suggests that you don't trust yourself. You, I actually thought I might forget how to hit the ball in front of people, which is a completely irrational fear and thought, but those are thoughts that we all have. And so I think this level of anxiety, this baseline level of anxiety that I had leading up to the match was very intense. It's very energy draining. We're going to get into that uh, a little bit uh, on how people can work with their energy and the anxiety that comes up in our daily lives and, and at work with the daily stress and also on the tennis court. So I think having a routine around uh, breathing, um, being able to talk to someone about it, uh, being able to have a, a story that I'm living into every day and I'm brainwashing my thoughts uh, my with and, and changing my beliefs so that they my behaviors and my actions are more congruent with someone who's a top 50 player or a top 10 player. Um, in the moment, I think um, certainly the sly smile after winning the set suggests that I was kind of content or happy to be there. If you watch Rafa Nadal or the other greats, it's pretty rare that they win the first set and they start smiling, right? So I think having, um, and it's great to have fun on the court, but I think having a level of intensity and and as you alluded to this idea of like, okay, you got the first set, um, let's clamp down now, you know, let's buckle down. Cause I did take the foot off the gas 
Uh, my level dropped about three to 5%, wasn't able to maintain it. That's what the top 10 players in the world, they maintain that level for a long period of time. So I think a combination of things I described would have helped me handle the moment better. Gotcha. Thanks, Jeff. And yeah, that's my only follow-up question for now. Yeah. So let me, let me take the listeners back uh, to how it all started. Uh, my father was my first coach. He was a division one tennis player at the university of Northern Colorado, go bears. And uh, he ended up teaching tennis in the Midwest and I was born in the Midwest and I had a racket in my hand at a young age for fun, you know, no pressure. My dad wasn't trying to make me a star, uh, but he did want to expose me to the sport early. And my mother was a player. And so I just started at a young age. I had exceptional hand-eye coordination and actually exceptional feet too. So pretty lucky to have two very athletic parents who got me started in sports early, not just tennis, but other sports. And so uh, that just started the journey with tennis, the love for tennis. And I think the bug really hit when I started winning trophies at age eight. Uh, I was number one in the state at, at nine years old as a 10 and under. Um, my stepfather was also a big influence on me, which we may go into a little bit today, um, some storytelling there. And he really helped me just forge my mental game and, and to develop character and, and uh, class on the court. Um, so my parents were really big on sportsmanship and handling yourself with class, winning winning or losing. And so um, I actually won more sportsmanship awards. Uh, I was kind of the goody two shoes of the tennis, junior tennis circuit, you know. Um, nice. I won more of those awards than I did actual gold balls. I won one gold ball, I was a national champion at age 12. Um, and this is where the, the story gets interesting because at 12 years old, when you're number one in the country, you're a bit of a phenom or you're, you know, on a track to do great things. <clears throat> and what happened to me was really unique. You know, I didn't grow. I was a late bloomer at 15 and a half. I was five foot four, 102 pounds. Uh, I could barely see over the ste steering wheel with my driver's permit. And um, I went to Kalamazoo uh, my first year 16s and I lost first round singles, first round doubles and first round back draw. Now, in tennis terms, we call that a triple crown. Uh, that's not a good triple crown like in horse racing when you win all three races. When you lose all three matches in a national tournament, people are starting to talk like, that guy got triple crown. And it's embarrassing. It's humiliating. And at 15 and a half, you think back three years earlier, I was winning this tournament. So that was a big pivotal moment for me, you know, and a lot of teenagers who are struggling with self-esteem and confidence like I was at that time, that's maybe a time where you quit or you pack it in or you start hanging out with your friends more. Well, um, my parents and, and we all kind of came together and they challenged me a little bit, but I challenged myself. And within a year, I turned it around. I got back to the basics and the fundamentals and I was top five in the country. A year after that, Stanford came calling. I got a lucky break there <clears throat> and coach school came calling and offered me a half scholarship that I accepted. And I went there and played for my dream school, you know, coming from Colorado, wasn't a tennis hotbed. I didn't play five hours a day. So going from Colorado where I played about an hour a day or an hour and a half to Stanford was a big jump up for me. And I rose to the occasion, you know, your environment, you often raise to the level of your environment. So Stanford was a great stepping stone for me. Coach Gould was great for me taught me many leadership lessons. <clears throat> and uh, an interesting defining moment there was after my freshman year, I had gone 22 and four my freshman year at number five single. So I knew how to win, but I didn't have any weapons. I mean, my weapons was my, my weapon was my mind and my smarts and my strategy. And that's probably what made me a, a, a decent coach or a good coach, whatever you want to call me um, and kind of knowing the game at a young age. After my freshman year, I had this crappy serve wasn't breaking 100 miles an hour. And I went home to Denver, Colorado to try to tweak it. And I started modeling Goran Ivanisevic. He was another lefty. And I modeled his serve. I, I grew three inches. I gained 20 pounds. And I modeled Goran's serve. And I added 20 miles an hour to my serve almost overnight. And I think that story speaks uh, to a couple of things for the listeners uh, to, to consider. Number one, uh, it's always possible to make a massive jump in your game if you get the right information and, and you, you know, you're willing to try some different things. You can have a breakthrough. And number two, just the sheer um, perseverance and the resilience to bounce back when you have a crappy serve or a crappy thing going on in your tennis game or in your life, you can change. You can get better. And so that's really one of my big messages around bouncing back and 
uh, perseverance, and also believing that you can really change, that you can make positive changes to brainwash your mind that that's possible. So I go back to Stanford after I won, uh, after I transformed this serve and Coach Gould was shocked and he was so shocked. He said, well, you're, you're a servant volleyer now and you're going to play number two this year. So I went from being a scrappy baseliner with no serve, kind of like Andy Roddick when he transformed his serve at 14 or 15, he was a scrapper and then he became this big server. That's what happened to me at a, you know, at a lower level than what Roddick did. So I played number one singles my junior and senior year. We won two national titles. I was a part of one uh, one of Coach Gould's three undefeated seasons my junior year. Uh, just learned so much. Probably the, the most memorable years of my life in tennis were playing for Stanford. And then I went out on the pro tour and just one year in, I got to 140 in the world when I played Chang. And I was the, you know up and come. I was going like this with my career. <clears throat> three months after uh, I was playing pickup basketball, I came down for a rebound. And I uh, felt a sharp pain in my ankle and it was misdiagnosed for eight months. I eventually had surgery and that became this, this two-year odyssey. It began where my body was breaking down. So 25 years old, I had two surgeries. I had many other injuries. My, sh- my arm was falling off. Uh, felt like it was going to fall off. And I thought about quitting then, you know, it was, it wasn't, was not in the cards for me, but <clears throat> I recalibrated and I became obsessed with all things high performance. I studied spirituality and mindset and nutrition, just this growth mindset to learn everything I could about the human body. And I was able to bounce back and I broke the top 100 in the world for the age at the age of 30 and went on to play in the main draw of all the grand slams. So that's my tennis arc story. I tried to get through it as, as fast as I, as I could. Um, I'll stop there because I'm sure you have questions. Um, but what I want to reiterate is that, you know, there were three defining moments, I would say, in my career. Well, probably four. I skipped one of them. But the one was the junior, you know, the change when I was 15, when I was really down and out. The second was my serve transformation. And then the third was the injury bug where instead of accepting what the doctors were telling me, I went on an odyssey to try to change things. And I did. I was able to change my body and my mind and my spirit and and become a better player in my 30s than I than I was in my 20s. Love that, Jeff. A lot of, um, you know, great golden nuggets in there. So I guess one is I'm curious, you mentioned the, you know, you had a pivotal moment when you were, as they say, triple crowned. um, And you said you mentioned that you went back to the basics and the fundamentals. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to what exactly you mean by going back to the the fundamentals. Sure. So a couple of things happened. Uh, At that time, I was small and other kids were growing. They were bigger than I was. And I had a coach that convinced me to change to a Wilson profile. And that was the worst decision I ever made equipment wise because that racket didn't support. It just didn't give me the control I needed. So I switched back to an original racket, like a Wilson pro staff or a Wilson sting. I can't even remember what I was playing with then or a Wilson ultra two, something, some Wilson sting or pro staff. So I changed rackets. Um, I quit all the sports that I was playing. So I went all in, I doubled down on tennis. I wasn't skiing anymore. I wasn't playing basketball. So obviously I had more time to devote, but when I, when I went back to the basics and I remember talking to my stepfather. He always would tell me he was a division one player. He played for the great Trinity teams back in the sixties. He would always say, go back to the basics, you know, keep your eye on the ball. I know it's super boring and, and the basics, but, and make sure you get your feet in position, get your body and your feet in position every single time. So it's kind of that Jimmy Connors model of just always getting your feet, have your feet be active and get into position. Nothing complicated certainly not as complicated as I've made it as a coach over the years. But um, I think that that level of focus on the footwork and the fundamentals, you know, get your racket back early. I know, again, that's not necessarily the things we teach now, but certainly when I was laid on a backhand, it was, okay, get your racket back, you know? So I think a lot of those fundamentals really came, came into play during that time and really changing my attitude because you know, when you start getting down on yourself, when you're missing shots, you're not able to pull yourself out as fast. So I really had to make a, a mindset shift and have a greater grit and resolve when I did make mistakes. Yeah. You, uh, your comments made me think back to a lot of different um, interviews I've done. One was with Michael Russell, um, great American player as well. I love coming on here and, and sharing um, just experiences with, with your, your audience. I think it's, um, the last few years have been amazing. So many people have reached out after the conference and 
um, and, and had good conversations online and, and signed up to the tennis menu, which has been great as well. So I really thank you for, for having me on again. And, um, hopefully I'm doing something right. If you had me on uh, this many times. So, uh, it's, it's great to be back. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Again, it's, it's a pleasure. And, um, yeah, uh, there's a reason why people have contacted you, you know, after your session. So really enjoy it and really excited to get into, to get into this one. So obviously, you know, the title is, has uh, data in it, uh, super interesting. And it's something that I think, um, the tennis world is certainly like lagged in comparison to other sports, um, you know, like golf and baseball, for example. So, uh, just kind of to set the stage, why is data so important to tennis and, and what is the impact of that? I think, I think data in particular is important, um, as it's factual information. And I think, you know, when we think data, we think purely numbers, but data to me is, is vision. It's, it's numbers, it's facts, it's not opinion. And, you know, when, when I first started, um, I was, I was working in Australian football in 2007 was the first time I actually saw data being used. And I'd never really seen it in tennis at that time. And that kind of sort of stimulated, um, some thought in, in me in that I thought, well, hang on, they're using this to construct their own training sessions, as well as game plans, as well as, um, measurements for improvement for their athletes. Why are we doing this in tennis? So I thought that would, was the, the starting point. I thought, gee, we're a long way behind. If we haven't even started and they've been doing this for a long period of time, why haven't we started? So I think it's important because it, it shows you and it gives you, um, like I said, the factual information that you can work from and then gives you measurement tools to be able to continually measure your progress from where you were to where you are now. And that to me is important in, in development of athletes of, um, from a coaching standpoint to sell a story to people, because sometimes you kind of think, you know, you've got a player in front of you and you say to them, you're improving, but their losses are, you know, having ha happening too frequently. And they're kind of saying to you, well, I'm not improving, but you, you measure from a, uh, an analytical standpoint and it shows them the improvement and maybe first serve percentage or first serve points one or uh, using their weapon a little bit more to create some forced errors from the opponent. And then they start to see the measurement being used and they think to themselves, well, they're the things we've been working on. Yeah, maybe I am improving. So it can, it can kind of sell the story and create a really good story for a coach to be able to tell their athlete. And, um, so it is important in, in so many aspects of the game. And I'm sure we'll touch on all the different ways of doing that as we go along. Yeah, definitely Mark. And, uh, it's, it's very, um, you know, smart of you and Sage that you, you know, when you saw that the data, um, in a different context in 2007, that, that you thought about like, why aren't we using it? So, um, you know, in terms of like, you know, types of data, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, we've got like the uh, strategy, technique, fitness, mental game, et cetera. Like, I was wondering, like, what, um, which ones of those have you been kind of focusing on? Or like, have you, have you just been looking at data for like all that stuff? Like, what have you been looking at lately? Yeah, I think the, the, the biggest thing with, with data is what am I going to use it for? So it's important that when you capture data, it's, it's, it's used in the way that it needs to be used. So for example, um, I have a great um, data scientist that I work with and, and I'll give him a pump up, but data-driven sports analytics, Shane Leonage, and I, we work together now for a, for a long period of time. And um, Shane is, is the data analyst for On Jabor and Arena Sabalenka, just to name a couple of um, incredible athletes he's working with. Um, and Shane and I started working together about probably seven or eight years ago now. And what we've done is he's come up with a lot of uh, data around shot loadings, for example. So, so how many shots are hit per match um, on average to give me an idea of what kind of loads I need to put into my athletes to reduce injury. So we always talk about overload, we talk about underload injuries, but what does that actually mean unless you've got the data? So but in particular, so you've got on the men's tour, on the ATP tour, uh, men are averaging 85.96 serves per match. The women are averaging 69.66. So you get a number like that and you think to yourself, well, what am I going to do with it? So for me, it's around how much am I loading my athletes in training so that therefore when they go to the match, their bodies are able to sustain the level for as long as they need to. Now, you're not hitting those 85 or 69 serves all at once either. You're doing serving, returning, serving, returning. So it can help you to structure your session to enable you to be more match specific and match like in terms of the way you go about your training sessions. 
um, a number, for example, like the 631 um, shots hit per match on the men's tour on average um, and on the women's tour of 530. So am I simulating enough balls being struck by my players that are going to allow their bodies to physically enable the rigors of the game? So from a, from a developmental standpoint, I think it's important to understand those kind of numbers. Um, yes, they're generic. Yes, they're averages and they're not specifics. And everyone has their own game style. So Ibo Karlovic, who serve and volleys and probably doesn't rally more than two or three balls, is going to be very different to a Diego Schwartzman, for example. So the individualism will come into it as we go along. But I think having the ability to understand loads of shot actually helps me to design a training session that all of my athletes can then go into tournaments and matches and be able to sustain and, and withstand that the physical nature of our game, which is is incredible. Like when you think of, you know, a team sport and, you know, I coach in the Australian Football League and, and for us, a player may touch the ball 15, 20, 30 times per game. Now, we play once a week. So in that one week of match orientated situations, they're touching the ball at most 30 times. Now, as a tennis player, we're hitting 631 shots per match. We may have to play six matches in one week, day after day. So our body is having to withstand so much physical strain that we need to be able to uh, give our players the best chance of survival. You know, it's a very survival paced sport um, in inverted commas. So, um, so the shot loadings for me are probably some of the most critical and are even to the point of, uh, you know, I know Craig O'Shaughnessy is big on uh, the the all ball um, kind of uh, point situations. Now, on the women's tour, 63% of points finish under four shots. On the men's tour, 66% finish under four shots. Now, that doesn't mean that we just practice the four shots, but that gives you an idea of how our sport is quite short, sharp, and powerful. So, you know, when, you, when you're training as a tennis athlete, Everything should be based around, okay, how do I set my serve up to get the first ball as a first strike? And do I, where do I put my return to get the first strike in the rally? So you use the numbers to be able to direct and guide your training sessions um, and also to tell you what the game is currently doing. And that is, I guess, if I'm, from a coaching standpoint, from a player's would be different. From a coaching standpoint, if I don't maintain my ability to stay in touch with the game, that I'm not developing my players for what they've got to come. So I need to stay in touch with the latest information and data. And that kind of is, for me at the moment in the, in the area I'm coaching in junior development a lot more of the time rather than the pro level, it is critical for me to understand what the game is doing and where the game is going. So the numbers give me those factual bits of information. So to answer your question, I think, you know, when we use um, how I'm using data is, is in that space at the moment from a developmental standpoint. And I guess the other part that I, I do use it for is measuring progress. So when we talk about technique, and I know you mentioned the word technique, tennis coaches gravitate to the word technique and gravitate to technical aspects of the game. And because they gravitate to that, all of the players are doing the same. So it was like, you know, you ask a question to an athlete, you know, what did you do in that situation? Why did you miss that ball? And they'll gravitate to the fact that they didn't hit enough topspin or their racket didn't go back early enough, or their left arm positioning wasn't across the body. So they gravitate to the technical side of the game. And that is important, but not as important as what the game actually asks you to do. So where should that shot have gone? How should you have played the shot there? What would you do next time you play that shot? So um, if we think um, data based on technique, we're thinking of visual stimulation. So we'll look at video analysis, we'll break it down, we'll draw lines. But a lot of the time, a lot of the reasons why we don't actually have success on the tennis court is not because of our technical side of the game. It's actually because of our decision-making and shot selection more often than not. No matter what level you play at, your technique is determined by your intent. Um, and your intent is around where you're trying to play, how you're trying to play it there, and why you're trying to play it there. So um, they're kind of the different aspects of, of data at the moment that I think are critical to the development of our players. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff in here. Um, you know, I think, um, so, I mean, is it as simple as as the concept of mirroring? So, like, let's say, you know, we see that, you know, we're, we're hitting, like, usually hitting, like, 70% forehands and a match 30% backhands, just for example. I mean, does that mean that, 
we, you know, when we're practicing, we should like mirror that? Or is there like more to the story as well? Oh, I think that's a, it's a great idea. You know, we had a, uh, there's a story of a player I was coaching um, a little while back and I'll, I'll probably keep his name close to my chest, but he's sort of sitting around the inside the, the 250 in the world market at the moment. And some of the data we came up with for him was every time he hit three forehands in a point, he won the point 95% of the time. So some of the training that we had to then mirror was, okay, well, how do we get that situation more often? Where do we need to play the forehand to get that happening a lot more? Um, and it's not just a matter of just hitting the forehand. It's actually where we're hitting it from and where we're hitting it to. So that's probably the, the, the layers of the story that probably need to occur as well is, you know, you could hit a forehand and you could be totally out of position to play it and it might not have the same effect. So, you know, we, we had to work out, yes, the three forehands were important, but where were those forehands going? And then how are we setting up the point? So for this particular player, we found that the, the two of the forehands had to be from the ad side of the court. So we had to set the game up. So the first forehand would probably go up the line if we possibly could from the juice side to shift the game back to the ad side of the court in terms of our recovery position and then utilize that forehand from the ad side of the court. So that's kind of the layers of, of the data that I think is very critical to, to understand as well. So you're right, the, the data gives us an ability to understand what we are doing, but how we utilize that's also important. So your data might say that you're missing more backhands than you are forehands. Does that mean you should practice more backhands because your backhand isn't working? Well, possibly not. It might mean that what you are doing with the previous ball is setting up the wrong situation for the backhand. It might mean that you are getting stuck in the backhand rally too often. It might mean that you're playing the backhand to the wrong shot on the court. So there's a little bit of a story behind the numbers. And a lot of the time when you see numbers, you've got to understand the reason behind them. Um, there's no point saying, oh, I made 50 unforced errors. I'm just going to keep the ball in the court longer. Because it might not be that is the reason why you made 50 unforced errors. So, you know, there's a lot of um, digging that needs to happen. And a lot of that comes down to, so a really big part of how I go about it is we get the data, but I, got, I also record every match that they play. So it's recording the match and keeping the match to understand the reason behind all the numbers. And that gives us a bit of an idea of how to shape training a little bit more. Gotcha. Very interesting. And as ver I really enjoyed the, um, you know, how you went into, um, you know, the professional player and how you're trying to set up more forehands. I mean, uh, that's, yeah, that's what I try to do as well. I mean, a lot of players um, would like that to be able to hit more forehands. So was that very specific to his case where he would, you know, hit one down the line and then, you know, have his forehand set up to hit at least a, a few more um, since he can hit, you know, inside outs and whatnot? Or or um, is that like a general strategy that you think like a lot of us maybe should be using even at club level? Um, look, it's interesting, you know, and I'll try and explain this as best as I possibly can, as clear as I can to, to give your, your audience a bit of an idea. So if you think about the court um, and I'm on the juice side of the court, now, if I'm on the juice side of the court um, and I play a ball cross court to the juice side of the court on the other side of the court, basically now, because my recovery position is, it, is going to be on the right of center, so I'm going to be roughly about one meter off the center because when you play a cross court ball, your recovery position will still be in that same zone. I now have a less chance of hitting a forehand on the next ball because there's so much more space to get to my back end. So in his situation, it was a matter of, of going, okay, well, how can I set the court up to enable me to have more space to hit a forehand? Now, by going down the line, the ball then, or the, the recovery position is on the ad side of the court. And when I'm on the ad side of the court, I now have roughly about a 65 to 70% chance of playing a forehand. So that's how I kind of th thought of it in that situation. The second part of that and the layers behind that is the grip that people hold. Now, if you have more semi-Western to Western-based grips, your court position for your forehand and you're better off playing um, from a court position standpoint from the ad side because of your Western and semi-Western grip to play inside out of the ball is a little bit easier than getting across the ball with your Western grip. But with an Eastern grip, it's probably a little easier to be on the juice side of the court because you actually can take time away. You don't have to actually get around the ball. You can actually hit flat through the line and change direction at any time. So it's kind of a different ball game. And it all depends on what grip you hold and what you, your, obviously your strategy is. And if you want to hit more forehands, you want to try and 
you know, get to whichever side of the court you need to, to be able to do that. But for this player in particular, we needed him on the ad side to maximize the potential of playing more forehand. So um, everyone can use that strategy and anyone can use that strategy if, if that's the, the, the way you want to go about it. But I think the court position standpoint is probably the most important to understand because if you can understand where your court positions are after each ball, you'll understand what the possibilities are of which shot you are going to play next more likely. So, um, you know, it's very easy to get to your backhand if you position yourself on the juice side. So your opponent could really expose your backhand side down the line if that happens. So I always encourage be the first one to change that direction if you can. Um, don't get stuck in the cross rally. Make sure you're the one that dictates the down the line ball to ensure that you have strike in the rally and you have the ascendancy in the point. Love that. Love that. And, and just um, another, um, you know, well, a question about like underloading, I guess um, maybe to dive into that deeper. G'day, I'm Dr. Mark Kovacs, excited to be talking about the misconceptions around tennis fitness. So with a lot of the athletes that I work with, most of them are at the elite level, professional, high-level college, uh, some of the top juniors in the world, uh, across a few different sports. But when it comes to tennis fitness specifically, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about how to train, what to focus on. And today I'm focusing specifically on the adult tennis player, the competitive adult tennis player that plays a few times a week uh, or more, uh, likes to compete, likes to uh, develop their game. They're working on their strokes. They're working on their movement. They're working on their overall tennis specific fitness. And they may have heard a lot of things. And I want to sort of discuss some of the things that people talk about and try to bring you some information that could help you in deciding how best to train for tennis fitness. So one of the first things is, does everyone know why Usain Bolt is the fastest person on the planet? There's two big reasons. One is his ability to generate force into the ground over less steps than everyone else that he plays against or that he competes against. So the goal is to put as much force into the ground in as few steps as possible. Uh, so he takes two to three steps less in a hundred meter race than his competition. So he's able to cover more ground because of his great force production, great technique, long limbs, all those things. So how does this relate to the tennis court? So from a tennis perspective, what we're relating it to is how we see our best players in the world move. So let's take a look here. We've got Novak Djokovic playing on clay here. So take into account the slide a little bit, but on hard court, we would ideally want our athletes to move with a similar fluidity. You watch some of the best movers of all time. They look so easy when they're out there. They move so effortlessly. And typically when we say they move so effortlessly, that means that they take less steps than everyone else. They're able to get to their outcome goal faster with less steps which requires less total energy. So one of the big misconceptions in the tennis world, and this has been propagated for too many decades, is that we want to take a lot of small steps. That's not ideally what we want to do. We want to take as few steps as possible to optimize our movement from point A to point B. Sometimes, obviously, on the tennis court, we need adjusting steps. That's that last step or two before contact. If we're trying to steady our feet, if there's wind, if the ball bounce is funny, there's always an option to take an adjusting step or two, but it shouldn't be our priority focus. Our priority focus should be how do we get and cover more ground quickly using larger steps. So that's something for you all to go practice is to figure out how can you take bigger steps under control uh, to cover the court better. The big problem is for many people is the reason they can't or don't want to take bigger steps is because they're limited in their range of motion, specifically in their hip flexors, in their adductors, the inner thigh muscles, um, possibly their hamstrings as well. So all these things potentially don't allow you to move the way you want to do from a mobility standpoint. The second is a strength and power perspective. To be able to move like this, you have to have great power production through the legs into the ground to be able to use the ground to then propel you in the direction you want to go. 
A lot of the time we talk about movement from a technical standpoint, and we're talking about the angles in should max the angles out. If we want to go out on a 45 degree angle, we sort of have to push into the ground on the opposing 45 degree angle. So that's one of the best ways that you can work on your tennis movement is to try to optimize your angles in and out of where you're trying to move from and where you're trying to move to. So those are a couple big things to focus on, but you can't assume that you're going to move like that if you don't have the strength and power of a player like that with the range of motion as well. But that doesn't mean that you can't work within your physical um, abilities currently to try to work through how do we increase just slightly our step count, how can we take longer steps, uh, how can we use the ground better. So when we talk about periodization and planning, there's a lot of misconceptions about this. How should we set our training program up? Should it be three days a week, five days a week? Should it be strength focus? Should it be uh, movement focus? Should it be a lot of endurance? Where do we put our focus and how do we appropriately progress? So block periodization is a traditional model where it has come from many other sports, swimming, track and field, weightlifting. These were traditional Olympic sports that were a big focus of sports federations in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and this is where a lot of this block model came from. This was because they only had two to three major competitions a year, uh, and their big focus was world championships and Olympic games. So you had all this training time where you could block, periodize the training, meaning you could do six weeks of strength, followed by six weeks of power, followed by six weeks of endurance, and you could block these areas of focus. In tennis, most of us are competing nearly year-round. Uh, working with the professional players, they have a very challenging schedule because they're on about a 10 to 11-month-a-year schedule of competition where they compete for two or three weeks, then they come home and train for two or three weeks, then they go back out, and they're doing that year-round. Uh, so at the adult level, Many times you have truncated seasons where you play your league matches uh, on a you know, certain number of weeks, and then you may have a few weeks off. Uh, so you have to sort of structure your programming in what we would call a nonlinear model, which means that you're not doing a block at this time and then a block at that time with specific focuses. What we typically program for a lot of tennis players is we'll hit the most areas of focus each week, but we will undulate or adjust our progressions based on what we're working on and what the needs are of the athlete. So for a very personalized program, something that we work with, and that's pretty much all we do is one-on-one um, -on -one personalization. Uh, we spent a lot of time doing a testing battery, understanding the strengths and opportunities for improvement, and then putting together a personalized program which hits on all the major areas of focus but it it changes the volumes and intensities uh based on where they are in their season and how it fits within their tournament schedule so for many of you that may be a little more um time and effort than you're used to but it is something that is potentially doable if you know your playing schedule and you work back from your tournaments Otherwise, if you know you sort of need to just be in sort of playing shape most of the year, what we usually do with that is we will hit a strength area on a certain day. So focus on strength, focus on power on another day, focus on tennis specific endurance on another day, focus on mobility heavily and all the injury prevention, core training, ankle training, shoulder, hip, things like that to make sure that you're developing the areas you need to be. Uh, a tennis player. This is not general fitness focused, it's tennis specific fitness focused. So obviously there's some areas that need to be addressed that are stressed more by hitting lots of tennis balls. And that's where you want to really try to personalize your training plan. So misconception. Uh, let's copy the pros. Why is that a misconception? Because we really don't know what physical capabilities you have compared to the pros. Most pros can't do everything that another pro can do. They can do some things, they can do most things, 
But even within the pros that we deal with, we can't get them doing all these type of exercises. They may have um, hip issues, ankle instability. They may have weakness in certain areas. They may have knee related challenges. So be careful when you see all those great videos um, online about what the pros are doing. Be careful about trying to copy them because even some pros unfortunately copy other pros and other sports sometimes. And we see quite a lot of people having issues where they try to overdo a movement that they're not ready for. So it doesn't mean the movement's bad. It doesn't mean the exercise is bad. It just means the athlete, which is likely you, isn't ready for that yet. Um, so be careful when you're trying to mimic what some of the pros do. So let's talk tennis specific endurance because there's a lot of misconceptions and discussions on this topic. How do you best train for tennis specific endurance? Uh, nearly 20 years ago now, I wrote some articles uh, in the research literature regarding tennis specific endurance. And we were analyzing players' work to rest ratios of professional players. And what we found which is pretty commonly known now, but back then it wasn't that well defined, was the work to rest ratios in tennis and specifically how that affects your energy system development, how it affects your glucose metabolism, how do, how do you burn fat versus carbohydrates based on the work to rest ratios of a tennis player. Uh, and we typically see, you know, that four to one, um, you know, rest to work actually ratio in a match, meaning that most matches are three to one, four to one because of the changeovers. And most points are on average less than five seconds and their rest periods are 20 to 25 seconds. Uh, and then you also have that 90 seconds every two games of the changeover. So over the course of a two and a half hour, three hour match, you're working your physical exertion period when you're actually playing points is 15 to 20 percent of the total training time uh the total match time whereas you know you've got over 80 percent of your time in many matches is recovery resting doesn't mean that's not productive time that is very important time because you have to get your heart rate down you have to consume um as much oxygen as possible during that time, you have to bring your heart rate down and you have to be ready for the next point. So all those factors um, are become really important in structuring the right type of training. And if anyone's gone and jogged and run a lot, they know that that doesn't necessarily immediately transfer to the tennis court. You need a combination of training concepts. So running five miles is the best way to get in tennis shape. That's a misconception. Cycling is the best way to get in a tennis shape. No. Intermittent high intensity interval workouts that are most similar to playing tennis provides the best return on your time. Another way to say that is playing tennis is the best way to get in a tennis shape because it's the most specific. You're out there anyway working on forehands, backhands, point construction, um, strategy, all that. So playing tennis is a really good way to work on getting into tennis shape. However, depending on your level, you may need to supplement that uh, with other types of training that can help. All right. I really hope that you enjoyed these three preview episodes on this week's podcast. And again, um, definitely check out uh, the full um, length sessions of these previews at Tennis Files Summit. Dot com go there to register for free and then you can watch these and you know about 40 presentations in total on technique strategy fitness and the mental game as well as equipment and yeah just get your free ticket you can watch them for free there's a option to upgrade as well if you want lifetime access so whatever works best for you um and yeah yeah looking forward to seeing you on the summit you know we've got a lot of great live sessions where you can ask the coaches questions as well so uh it will be a fantastic uh event i'm sure of it uh you know the coaches and i work our hardest to bring you the best possible content and yeah i'll see you there and just want to leave you with a quote as i do at the end of every show this one is by abraham lincoln and abraham said 
in the end. It's not the years in your life that count. It's the life in your years. So there you go. So yeah, uh, again, I hope to see you at Tennis Summit 2023 and so that you can pick up the most valuable advice um, for your particular um, game that you can use to improve and that you take action on. So I'll see you there and have a great one and talk to you soon.